to everyone to our online viewers and our regular church members thank you for joining our worship service today we are delighted to have you join with us and we look forward to having you for the next few weeks this series has at heart the youths who may be struggling with the question does god still love me regardless of how i identify myself this question can cause confusion within our youths. Hence the title, Confused, Why Are You So Confused? We, the leadership, feel it is important to start having these conversations about sexuality, both at home and in the church. This month's program aims to educate the youth, parents and the church of the social issues the youths are facing. We want the youths to know that they are not alone and that the church and Jesus loves them. I'd also like, would like to introduce our first speaker for this program, uh, Pastor Dan Majidukan, who has been serving at Bilston Church and he has two other congregations he's working with as well. Since he has been with us, he's demonstrated the love and character of Jesus, both to youths and adults. He is extremely excited about being a part of this program 
And for those of you who will be hearing him speak for the first time, will recognize that he's visually creative in his sharing of God's words. I know that today you will receive a blessing from the message he's presenting to us. But before he speaks, uh, we will have a prayer followed by a special song. So lastly from me, a word of encouragement before we pray. It's inspired by Psalms 51 verses one and two. And this is a little word. Even if you take a thousand steps from God, you will only have to turn around and take one step backwards to him because he has followed you all the way. And thank you for joining us. We are now approach the Lord in prayer. I would invite those of you who are able, you know what I'm going to say, I count it a privilege, a privilege to be able to kneel before the Lord in prayer. I would invite all of you who are able to join me also. For those of you who are not in a position to do so, please adopt a reverent position as we seek the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, everlasting Father, hallowed, blessed, wonderful is thy name. Lord, humbly we bow before you. Humbly, Lord, we approach your throne of grace. First of all, Lord, to praise you, to, to lift your name on high. You, Lord, who through the power of your might spoke and worlds and life forms, ecosystems came into being, Lord, simply because you spoke the words and it was so. Lord, your ways are beyond finding out. Those same life forms, those same ecosystems, even the world's greatest minds and scholars, through thousands of years of studying and trying to find out, still, Lord, cannot even piece together some of the most basic elements of this world that you have created. You truly are a wonderful God. And Lord, not only are you wonderful in power and in might and in wisdom and in glory, but Lord, your love and your mercy is, is boundless. It knows no bounds. And so even when we had, before even, Lord, we had stooped into sin, before we had decided to separate us from your love, you had already set in place a wonderful, breathtaking plan whereby we, Lord, could not only be pardoned and rescued from the consequence of our sin, but that, Lord, we could be called the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. And as the sons and daughters of the Most High God, we can claim and inherit an inheritance fit, worthy for the prince, princes, the kings and the rulers of not just this earth, but of the world to come. Lord, you are, you are awesome. You are awesome. Thank you, Father, for the thing that you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the thing that you are doing for us, even now, even when we cannot perceive it, even when we are crying out for the thing that we do not perceive or recognize, Lord, you are still doing it even then. And Lord, we thank you for the things that are yet to come. We have a saying, Lord, that the best is yet to come. Father, I believe firmly. I read in your word clearly that there are things that you have promised you will do which you have not done yet but which we believe are near even at the door heavenly father we love you we worship you we we adore you Lord. we are in awe of you we fear you father we come because we recognize that we are sinners and we are in desperate need of your forgiving merciful nature we need the cleansing that is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, if there is anybody here today who does not recognize their need of that cleansing, I pray, Lord, that you would open their eyes so that they would see how desperately in need they are of your mercy and your grace. Oh, Lord, we claim it. We grasp hold of it in faith in Jesus Christ. 
And Lord, not only for the forgiveness of sins, but Lord, we, we plead with you for the power, for the power to live victorious lives in this earth, that we may be pleasing to you, that we may be an example to those around us. Lord, help us to love as you love. Lord, your love for us has no sense, no hint of self in it. Lord, help us to love like you love. Help us to love our wives like you love us. Help us to love our husbands like you love us. Help us to love our children, Heavenly Father, our young people, your children, in the way that you love us. Lord, you are the best father. The way that you father us, you are so patient. Lord, help us as parents to be patient. You're so merciful. You are so gentle, so long-suffering, so generous, so warm. Lord, you constantly consider and desire our good. Help us, Lord, as parents to be this way to our children. Lord, we cannot perform these deeds unless your Holy Spirit should take hold of us and transform us anew. Heavenly Father, today we present ourselves, Bilston Church, the families represented, those online watching, visitors, neighbours. Lord, we present ourselves before you, asking that your Holy Spirit would take charge of our life, root out the weeds that we have cultivated in our personal experience and lord reconnect us with the life giver with the vine jesus christ heavenly father we are embarking upon a, a series of meetings and events all focused around some of the world's most pressing most bemusing elements most bewildering elements father the confusion the distress the incongruence that many people, young people and others feel in terms of who are they? Who are they? Who should they be? Who would you have us be? Lord, there is so much deception and there's so many opaque opinions in this regard. Lord, I pray that you through your Holy Spirit would make all things clear. May we be disabused of our earthly, carnal, sensual ideas. And in their place, Lord, may, may we have a clear perception of a thus saith the Lord. Father, we thank you for your leading in this regard. I present before you your manservant for the hour, Pastor Dan. Lord, I thank you for his ministry, for his family, for his life. Lord, hide him behind the cross, I pray. Take the coal, Lord, off the fire and anoint his lips one more time use him dear father to bring glory honor to your name may he speak the truth but lord may it be delivered in the love and the mercy and the grace of jesus christ yes. father thank you for what you're doing in your church we praise you we glorify you may everything that is said here today be to your name's honor and glory and lord may your coming be soon May those under the hearing of my voice be fit and ready, prepared to meet you. We look forward to this day. May it be so according to your will, your grace, your intention for our life. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 i 
to find a soul to care. And in the darkest hour, you touch me with your
It is a rare privilege to be speaking to all of you today and to our young people in particular. I hope and pray that each week as this theme is particularly curated for our young people, that the Lord will bless our humble efforts and that the Holy Spirit will speak clearly to your hearts through the theme and the subtopics that have been prayerfully made ready for your spiritual consumption and life application. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When we read the first chapter of Genesis, we have to ask, what kind of text is this? What type of literature is this? Is Genesis supposed to be a poetry? Is it supposed to be an allegory? Now, please don't forget that Genesis is written in historical narrative Hebrew. It is not lyrical poetic form. It is written in historical style and it's meant to be taken as straightforward literal history. The Bible clearly says that God created everything in six literal days, just like our days now. Now, in the late 1800s, some people began to suggest that our origin took millions of years through the process of evolution. This evolutionary theory seems to have influenced so many Christians. And so they have this belief now amongst Christians that creation took millions of years to finish. Now, that is a hybrid belief that accommodates evolution, that creation involved death, pain, and survival of the fittest. However, that's problematic. In order to add millions of years in between verse 1 and verse 2, you have to deal with the grammar of the text. No one can refute that the Hebrew word yom means a 24-hour day right there, which comprised of an evening and a morning. And the evening and the morning were the first day, Genesis 1.5. And the evening and the morning were the second day, Genesis 1.8. And the evening and the morning were the third day, Genesis 1.13, and the evening and the morning with the fourth day, Genesis 1.19, and so on and so forth up to the seventh day. And each of those days was ordinary, approximately 24-hour day period. In fact, that is the reason why in Exodus 20.11, as God was speaking to Moses and to the Israelites, including the mixed multitude with them, he said, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, God said He made everything in six days and rested for one, as a basis for the seven-day week cycle that we have today. All countries in the world observe a seven-day cycle. All people have the same seven-day cycle in their calendar. Who taught us that? Who decided about it? It's not from scientific books. It's not astronomy. Nowhere can we find the origin of that except in the ancient Hebrew scriptures, the Bible. You see, in our solar system, when we ask what goes around every 24 hours, the answer to that is the earth turns or spins once on its axis. What goes around every month or every moon? Well, the moon circles the earth. What goes around every year? The answer is the earth makes one revolution around the sun. Now, the question then is what goes around every week? What goes around every seven days? The answer to that is nothing. You see, the seven-day week cycle, contrary to the day, the month, and the year, is not tied to any astronomical cycle. Where did it come from? It's not from science. It's from history. It is from ancient record. You cannot find it anywhere except the ancient Hebrew writing, the Genesis account of creation. And Jesus himself referred to Genesis in multiple locations. And each time he is referring to Genesis, he refers to it as a real history. Matthew 19, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Jesus in the New Testament is endorsing creation story. It's not an evolutionary theory that embraces over the millions of years 
but the straightforward narrative of a six-day creation, and on the seventh, he rested and made it a memorial of that creation. Now, before I will move on to the crowning act of creation, the creation of mankind, let me first alert you that this hybrid understanding of millions of years will become more and more popular towards the end time. Nine years before Pope John Paul II died, he gave a message to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences on the 22nd of October 1996. That meeting was convened to discuss the origins of life. And he issued a number of statements that favored evolution as a reasonable explanation for human origin. Note his words. In his encyclical Humani Generis in 1915, my predecessor Pius XII has already affirmed that there is no conflict between evolution and the doctrine of the faith regarding man and his vocation, provided that we do not lose sight of certain fixed points. And further expounding on Pope XII's Humani Generis, Pope John Paul II continued, Pius XII stressed this essential point. If the human body take its origin from pre-existent living matter, the spiritual soul is immediately created by God. Now, let me explain this to you in plain and simple form because this is the stand of the leadership of the Roman Church. The Pope says, let the human organisms evolve from pre-existing living matter. That's fine. You can bring your theory, your research about how we began. Your research is fine. Evolution gave us the physical body and that we came from monkeys, that's fine. That's all right with us. But there is the fixed point. Here is the non-negotiable part. God supernaturally created the soul. That's what it means in the statement. And by the way, the Bible is clear. God did not put a soul into Adam. God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We don't have a soul. We are the living soul. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And some would say that the two popes, namely Pope Pius XII and Pope John Paul II, do not really mean to believe in evolution because of the word if. If the human body. Well, here is what Pope Francis is saying at a meeting more recently, yet again, of the Vatican's Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Pope Francis said that evolution was compatible with our history. When we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so. He created human beings and let them develop according to the internal laws that he gave to each one so they would reach their fulfillment. You see, it is a straightforward denial of what is declared in Scripture in the account of creation. No more let there be light and there was light. No more for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. No more of that. Again, Look at this. When we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so. Really? But that is exactly how Genesis narrates it. God just commanded it and it stood. Let there be light. Let there be ferment. Let there be grass. Let there be living creatures. He just commanded and it stood firm. So now, as you can see, this accommodation of evolution plus soul makes a hybrid belief system of our origin that is alien to the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is now replaced with the theory of man. In this day and age, when people do not read the Word, they are ignorant of the Word, they do not read the Word of God for themselves and simply rely on what is given to them from the pulpit or what they think is popular, they will just believe everything that they hear and what they want to believe. But the Bible is relevant in your life and in my life. It is ancient, yes, but it is relevant even to the postmodern person like you and me, because the Word of God is truth. And truth 
does not change. The Bible is no ordinary book. It contains the truth. Its principles of truth are unchanging. Truth is truth, even if you don't like it. You see, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. Now, if the word of God is a lamp into my feet and light unto my path, if you take away that lamp, if you take away that light, if you take away that word, if you deny that word, what remains? Darkness. That's the reason why we are to be guided by the word of God. Now, I would like us to focus on the crowning acts of creation, the creation of human beings. Let us start with the endorsement of Jesus in Matthew 19. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. As you can see here, Jesus is endorsing the narrative of the history of creation. Haven't you read? He asked. Read it and accept it as it is. Jesus is saying there was a creator. He made them male and female. There was no development over eons of years. They were perfect male and female, straight from the hand of the Creator. We did not come from monkeys. We did not evolve from simple life forms, such as the bacteria. We did not come from them. Mankind is created as male and female, perfect from the hand of the Creator. There was no evolution over billions of years. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Man and every beast existed together, and mankind's role in the beginning is to manage over them. You see, science textbooks have been teaching our children, your children and mine, that dinosaurs lived millions of years before humans came. The reason? It is because they said dinosaurs and humans could not exist together because humans would not survive with the dinosaurs. In another time, we are going to refute that. We will study dinosaurs recorded in the Bible and that dinosaurs are creatures created by God and God himself says so. This is for another time. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, in harmony with my task and the topic that is given to me, I must focus in particular the statement, male and female, he created them. And so the first point that we can see comes from the equal pairing of male and female in parallel in Genesis 1.27. So God created Ha-Adam, humankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. The man and the woman together make humankind. And so the holistic picture of humankind is only complete when both male and female are viewed together. And this description points to the complementarity and the individuality of the sexes. There is no hint of ontological or functional superiority or inferiority between the sexes. Both are equally immediate to the Creator and His act. Both are given the same dominion over the earth and other living creatures. In short, both participate equally in the image of God. Now, the second point that I would like to bring to your attention is that the human male, formed before female, was originally created in anticipation of the future. He was created with those desire and those drives towards union with his counterpart. Look at this encounter with the animals before his female counterpart was created. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. 
When he looked at the birds, the beasts, all living creatures, it dramatically points up to his need of a counterpart or someone corresponding to him. You see, God created him first, intentionally, and he gave him life, and then he created in him a longing for someone like him. It was not an accident that God exposed Adam to see all the pairs of all animals and with their partners. It was planned. It was God's design. The bears and the orangutans, the elephants and the baboons, he saw them all. And he did not find them as his counterpart. He did not look at them as his cousins. They were not like him. They were different. And this realization was part of the creation process. God made it that way. It was placed in him, the realization that the animals are complete. They are ready to receive the blessing of procreation so that they will multiply all of them except Adam. And so this is intentional exposure to these pairs, created a deep longing within him, the desire for companionship and fellowship of someone comparable to him. And we read, And God caused him to sleep, performed the first surgery, opened up his side, and took a bone called rib. He slept with a longing, with a desire to be with and to see someone comparable to him. And when he awoke, he awoke into his dream. God introduced to him the woman. And Adam, at some point in his excitement, must have exclaimed, Oh yes, this is what I'm talking about. God created that longing in him. And such longing, such desire, and such need is satisfied when he is introduced to the woman as his perfect counterpart, his perfect complement. He is male, she is female. Adam was created in anticipation of the future. He was made to feel complete on her arrival, and humankind was complete with the creation and the arrival of the female as Adam's equal counterpart. And the third point that we see here, back in the beginning, are the details in the creation of the woman. God took a bone out of the man, not from the legs or from the feet, not from the neck or from the head, it's from the side. Not a bone in front or a bone at the back, but beside. God could have taken a tooth or a vertebra, but he did not do that. He took a rib from the side. Now, when someone stands beside you, when one is next to you, particularly beside you, you understand that you are both equal. You see, the Son of Man sits not at the back or in front. The Son of Man sits at the right-hand side of the Father. He then confirms, I and my Father are one. Now, because a man is created first and then woman, it has been asserted by some that by this the priority and superiority of man and the dependence of the woman upon the man are established as an ordinance of divine creation. However, we beg to disagree. The reason for that is Hebrew literature often makes use of an enclosure device in which the points of central concern are placed at the beginning and at the end of the unit. This is the case in Genesis 2 because the entire account is cast in the form of an enclosure or ring construction. In other words, the creation of man at the beginning of the narrative and the creation of the woman at the end of the narrative correspond to each other in importance. You see, the movement in Genesis 2 is not from superior to inferior. The movement in Genesis 2 is from incompleteness to completeness. From incompleteness because the male human being was intentionally made to realize that he needs someone like him. And when the woman was brought to him, then it was complete. So the motif or the theme for mankind is from incompleteness to completeness. Woman is created as the climax, the culmination of the story. She is the final creation that then finishes the ring construction. 
the male and the female back at creation is the holistic, perfect picture of what mankind is all about. And some say that the woman is created as a helper because they read, but for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Well, the word iser is usually translated as help or helper in English. This, however, is a misleading translation because the English word helper tends to suggest one who is an assistant or a subordinate or an inferior. But the Hebrew word izeh carries no such connotation. In fact, the Hebrew Bible most frequently employs izeh to describe a superior helper, God himself as the helper, the izeh of Israel. Now, what we are saying here is the word izeh in this context is a relational term describing a beneficial relationship. And the word izeh does not specify position or rank, either superiority or inferiority. You see, Eve is Adam's benefactor or helper, corresponding to him. She is his counterpart, his complement. Eve is equal to him. She is Adam's partner. Male and female are not to rule over each other, but they are to rule over creation from the very beginning. Both male and female, instead, have equal dominion over the things that God created. And the fourth point concerning man's creation as male and female that we note is that sexual differentiation is presented as a creation by God. God already determined the differentiation of sexes and how they would relate to each other. There is a clear emphasis upon the creation of sexual distinction from the very beginning between male and female, different from each other, but to complement each other. To create a male human being and then create another male human being would contradict the design of complementarity and the blessing to procreate because males do not have ovaries to carry the fetus. Now, this anatomy and biology correspond to the design of the all-knowing intelligent creator. And I would like to reinforce here the institution of marriage back in the beginning. You see, day after day of creation week, God spoke the miracle words, let there be, and the things came to being. Suddenly, the earth broke forth with laughter, bubbling brook and rumbling river, singing birds and swimming fish, rolling hills and peaceful plains, bouncing beasts and crawling creatures, graceful grass and fragrant flowers, Shining moon and starlit sky, all creation joined the anthem of praise. And then came Friday, the first Friday in Eden, and God was ready to perform the crowning act of His creation. No longer did He say, let there be. Instead, He said, let us make man in our image. And we know that the word us is plural. And it infers that more than one person participated in this creative act. The first chapter of John gives light on the first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Now the question is, who was this Word? Who was this co-creator back in the beginning? And John 1.14 tells us that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That Word is Jesus, God the Son. He was the co-creator with God the Father. Nothing was ever made without Him. And God, the Holy Spirit, was also present. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Therefore, in the creation of mankind, the Father was conversing with the Son in the company of the Holy Spirit. When the man was introduced to the woman, and when they faced each other, inexpressible joy sparkled their eyes. Fathomless love flooded their hearts, and they fell into the arms of one another. They were in love. Then came marriage. Adam, the groom, stood beside Eve. 
Eve, the bride, stood beside Adam, while God was in front of them, and he was the minister. And God conducted the ceremony. Perhaps a choir of angels sang a song, while all nature peeped in excitement, and all heavens watched in wonder. How can we know there was marriage? It is because the Bible records both the vow of the bridegroom and the pronouncement of the minister. Here is the record of Adam's marriage vow. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Meaning, we are now inseparable. We are one. I look after you as I look after my own. I'm yours and you are mine. Now listen to the statement of the minister. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Jesus confirmed the speaker. The one who spoke in verse 24 was God himself, and that's why Jesus made a statement concerning this in Matthew 19. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He made them male and female, said and declared to them their inseparable union. Jesus said, This is how it works. He knows because he was present in the creation of the world and everything in it. So there was marriage in the beautiful Garden of Eden, and God himself was the minister. The Bible says God blessed them. Adam did not take Eve and run away with her. He married her. He did not snatch the woman to have union with her. He was wedded to her. Adam did not practice concubinage. He practiced marriage. Adam did not live in. He was married. And there is a special blessing added after they were created. Genesis 1, 28, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so both are to share alike in the blessing and the responsibility of procreation. Male and female, he blessed them with the power to procreate, to multiply. And the reason why we are here today is because of the union of a male and female. You see, families are formed, societies are formed after this pattern. It is ancient, but it is the truth. And this truth is relevant all across the face of the earth. Adam and Eve, it was not Adam and Steve, Adam and Eve. It was not Adriana and Eve. Of course, it has been made legal in the UK, the US, and other parts of the world more recently for Adam and Steve or Eva and Evelyn to be together. But that is just a recent man-made rule. In the beginning, it was not so. What we know from the account of creation, confirmed by Jesus himself, that in the beginning, Male and female were created by God, and He blessed them so that you and I will be here today. He designed it that way. Through His creative act, He fashioned human beings after His own image. He created them male and female. And we see clearly God's personal assessment of His creation. According to verse 31, Then God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. God saw everything he had made, including the distinction of gender and sexuality of his crowning work of creation, and behold, it was very good. And you know, the Hebrew expression very good connotes the quintessence of goodness, wholesomeness, appropriateness, perfection, and beauty. You and I are created in his image. We are created with a purpose. We are created in His love. We are created to honor and to glorify our Maker. And that's how it is designed. And that's how it works. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness towards us, for creating us, for fashioning us as human beings. We are part of your plan since even before the foundation of the world. Thank you even for dying on the cross for us to redeem 
the lost world. We pray for our young people. We pray for anyone listening today that the Holy Spirit will reach out to them, that they may love and adhere to the truth. In the name of Jesus, I pray and thank you. Amen. 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 for your message thank you for everyone who are here and we just want to encourage you 
next week is going to continue. And next week topic is looking on why are you so confused? Pastor laid the foundation and therefore why are you so confused? If you want to know, please come along next week and tell your friends, don't keep it to yourself, please. Tell your friends you've got children, you've got grandchildren, please get them along so that they can hear the reason why you know, they are confused, what it is that society wants them to know. And therefore, we ask that you will have a good week and we're praying for you and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks very much. God bless.